signal when you've got five minutes left. Oh, I think the best I think the star is going to power down that thing. Oh, I think I, 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 I even think it's going to be a chance to get some power to the line. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think in the interest of people's time, we'll get started. Welcome to Bloomberg Nursing's fifth annual Werner Huffman Splain Lecture, an event that's been made possible through the generosity of Dr. Richard Splain and the Splain family. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Throughout her career, Verna Huffman Splain concentrated on national and international health planning policy development and the extended role of the nurse. After receiving her diploma in public health nursing from the School of Nursing, as it was then, at the University of Toronto, she went on to become Canada's first Chief Nursing Officer, a role she served in until 1972. And it is now my pleasure to invite you to hear opening remarks from Canada's newly appointed Chief Nursing Officer, who is also a graduate of Bloomberg Nursing, Dr Lee Chapman. My name is Lee Chapman. I'm the, the Chief, Chief Nursing Officer, Officer for Health Canada. Canada. I'm honoured to have been asked to speak at this important event, which serves to recognise the importance of nursing leadership through the award of an honorary degree to Annette Kennedy, President Emerita of ICN, and highlight her insights and experience through the Verna Huffman Splain Lecture. As you may know, the University of Toronto's Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing holds a special place in my heart, as this is where I completed my doctoral studies under the supervision of Dr. Siobhan Nelson. The reinstatement of the federal CNO has come at a critical time in healthcare. This COVID-19 pandemic has revealed and exacerbated many gaps in the system, and these are having a devastating impact. The state of our healthcare system is no doubt in a state of crisis, but with each crisis comes an opportunity to share innovative strategies and make necessary changes. We must take advantage of this opportunity um, the opportunity that's before us to address these challenges by harness, harnessing the leadership and skills inherent in our profession to build a more efficient, resilient, and sustainable healthcare system for the future. My nursing career has spanned almost 20 years, through, and throughout this time I've gained a deep understanding of the profession through a variety of clinical leadership positions in home and community care, research, academic, regulatory, and professional practice environments. The knowledge gleaned from my education and my professional experiences have equipped me to succeed within this leadership position um, as CNO. That being said, I cannot be effective in this role without collaboration from the nursing community. A bilateral relationship is required, and I believe continuous engagement in critical inquiry and self-reflection is required for effective leadership. So I remain humble in this position, and I'm excited to continue to learn from nurses across the country to develop a broadened pan-Canadian view of the profession. My current role recognizes the important contribution of nurses at the federal level and aims to increase the visibility and input in decisions affecting nurses. 
Within this context, I provide strategic advice from a nursing perspective to the health, health portfolio on priority program and policy areas, including health workforce planning um, and stability, mental health, harm reduction, models of care and scope of practice. I play a convening role with provincial and territorial governments, along with federal health populations, nursing stakeholders, regulatory bodies, colleges and educators on key nursing issues, and I represent the government of Canada at public forums both within and outside of Canada. As previously stated, I cannot be successful in this role without collaboration and engagement from the entire nursing community. Everyone has a role to play, from education to regulation, professional associations to unions, employers to frontline staff, and all levels of government, and certainly including educators and uh, universities. Collective action and support is required to ensure the continued effectiveness of our publicly funded healthcare system, which is a source of great pride for all Canadians. So once again, I thank you for the invitation to speak at this event, and so I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. I extend my gratitude to the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing, Dr. Linda Johnson, and the leadership team. And I'd like to close my remarks by extending a, a warm congratulations to Annette Kennedy on being awarded an honorary degree from the University of Toronto. Additionally, I wanted to take a moment to commemorate the late Verna Huffman, Huffman Splain, an influential nursing leader whose memory remains ever present. Thank you very much. Merci, miigwech. We thank Lee for her words and her commitment to the role and the profession. Verna Huffman Splain was indeed a staunch advocate for nurses and their capacity for leadership. We have the ability to address the challenges that face our health system, not singularly, but as a collective voice. And I'm delighted to see so many of you here in person and online for this important and timely discussion around nurses and their leadership in the face of our current nursing workforce crisis. The shortage of nurses and the strain on the healthcare systems is a challenge that goes beyond our borders and is being experienced by many countries around the world on the heels of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of nursing retention is just one of the many challenges facing nurses today. International nursing bodies like the International Council of Nurses are true leaders in raising the voice of nurses around the world and holding policymakers accountable to ensure better care for all people. Dr. Michelle Acorn, Chief Nurse of the International Council of Nurses in her recent monthly update has called for a transformation of culture that sees respect for nursing, not only sustained, but considered essential. To speak on these issues and the need for nurses to take collective action to create lasting change in the health system, I'm pleased to welcome our keynote speaker, Annette Kennedy, President Emerita, of the International Council of Nurses and now an honorary degree recipient at the University of Toronto. Annette is a true champion of health equity and universal access to healthcare. As the 28th president of the ICN, Annette presided over 28 million nurses worldwide and during her term was appointed commissioner on the WHO Independent High Level Commission on Non-Communicable Diseases. A registered nurse and midwife, Annette was named one of the 100 most outstanding nurse and midwifery leaders in the 2020 by Women in Global Health and the WHO, and in 2021 was awarded the WHO Director General's Global Health Leaders Award. She received an honorary doctorate in 2020 from Dublin City University, and most recently was conferred the Doctor of Degrees of, uh, excuse me, Degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa from the University of Toronto. She's currently working with the Santa Marta Group and other organisations on modern slavery and human trafficking. And she's also an advisor to the Women in Global Health Island Committee. Welcome, Annette. Just in case I forget anything. Good afternoon, everybody, and its distinguished guests, it's lovely to be here, and thank you for inviting me for this prestigious lecture 
for Averna because from what I gather, she did a huge lot of work and particularly in relation to um, chief nurses, government chief nurses and public health. We could have lot, learned a lot from her for COVID-19. You know, earlier on I was asked a lot of questions by some very nice students and have been asked a lot of things um, at various times. And I tend to give very honest answers. But the first question that I was asked was about nursing and going into nursing. And I'm going to embarrass my sister now, right now, who's down there. Because at the time that I went into nursing, there were four choices. It was the religious life, it was teaching, it was either secretarial or it was nursing. And nobody ever uh, in my area was doing architecture, was doing engineering, was doing science or doing anything like that. And my mother saying, it's time you went out and got a job. So she says to my sister, who was a nurse at the time, what do you think about Annette becoming a nurse? And she said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. She'd be very, I'd be very worried about the patients that she would be looking after. <laughs> her recall is very poor, but I keep <laughs> reminding her of all the times. <laughs> so, in case you're looking at this, this is Ireland. So for all of you, you're very welcome. It's a beautiful country, and this is my county, County Wicklow. So it is. Um, and we're very proud of it. And sometimes I think that Ireland is a big country. And we think it's a big country, you know. And we move around a lot. We get around across the world. And then I looked at Canada and I realized that Ireland could fit 142 times into Canada. And I thought, hmm, we must be small, <laughs> you know. Anyway. I thought I'd show you this because, you know, you forget over two years, everything was COVID. Since 2020, it's COVID. But a lot of other things happened besides COVID. It was the year of the nurse and the midwife. We expected great things, and it was a great year. It was, but unfortunately, it was a very different year. It did show that nurses were the backbone of the health service, and nurses did save lives, much more lives than anybody else throughout the world. But it also was the year of climate change, of crisis, of, of course, a lot of war and a lot of flooding and fire. And of course, you remember that great explosion that happened in the Lebanon. And I always remember that because there was a picture of a nurse bringing out three little babies. And I don't know if any of you ever saw the video that went with that when the hospital was um, actually um, very badly um, destroyed. But she was sitting at her desk and she was thrown to the side of her desk and she went unconscious. And as soon as she woke up, you can see her taking away the um, boards from the sides and running to catch three little babies and bring them outside. It, it still remains in my memory. So a lot of things happened and of course here you have, now it seems like healthcare and health workers are not protected any longer in war because they're now becoming the targets. And of course you have Ukraine and you have monkeypox. So here, you can probably spot Ireland somewhere there. Um, <laughs> it's spot the dot. But all the colors there are the National Nurses Association in ICN. It's not quite up to date, 
because the RCN is in, so that's the UK should be up there. And there's a few more. But the reason that I'm showing you this is up on the left-hand corner is a picture of our first leaders, why they started ICN. And they started ICN because they were meeting other women um, across the country who are fighting for the vote for women, fighting for um, actually women to work and women to be paid to work. And that was in 1899. So they decided at that time that perhaps, because they were all nurses, perhaps there was some reason that they should get together and form an association like ICN so that you could have collaboration and communication and exchange and maybe improve the education and the conditions of employment and salary for nurses. And that's what happened. That's why ICN was started. And we continue the same trend. Down here on the left is women in global health. And that's today. We're still fighting for equality. But we have moved. We definitely have moved. But we're still at the fight for equality. And it's a good organization, Women in Global Health. There's a chapter here, there's a chapter in Ireland, there's a chapter in a lot of different countries. Sometimes you wonder what international organizations do. And I did myself too. There were times before even I was president of the European Federation of Nurses, I said, oh yeah, but what are they doing? Like, it's more important to be at home, it's more important to know um, and to be involved in national issues. And let me tell you a story that happened at that time. During the late 90s and early 200s, Ireland was probably the fastest growing economy in the world. We were called the Celtic Tiger. And then suddenly, towards the end of 2000, the crash came and the banks the money went out of the banks. And so we were dependent on the International Monetary Fund, on the European banking, and all of those. And what you discover is that suddenly the authority and the direction and the decision making is not within your country's remit. It suddenly becomes dictation from the banks who are loaning the money. And so we saw at that time, and I saw for the first time, the real issue in relation to um, being in the global community or the international community at some shape or form. Because when cuts came, and cuts came not just to right across all the public services and everything, but it came to nursing, it came to health, and it increased the number of hours, it cut the number of jobs. That wasn't done by our government. That was done through dictation from the banks. And at that stage, I thought to myself, yeah, this is one reason that you need to be at every table, whether it be international, whether it be European, or whether it be whatever table you can be at because you're fighting for nursing, and you're fighting for nursing in its right. So, what does ICN do? And there is a list of things that we do. But the reason that a lot of those things are up there is because any of those issues apply to every country throughout the world. Every single thing. We all need a chief nurse in our country. We all need data collection on the state of nursing in our country. We all need a strategic direction. We all need to worry about the next pandemic, even this one. We all need to worry about the health and safety, patient safety, infectious diseases, primary health care, women's health, NCDs, universal health care. Human trafficking is much that I like to do something about, and health systems reform, very important health systems reform. But, it may be that these are different stages of the economy of the country, but the issues remain the same. 
shortage of workforce, poor conditions, health and safety of our workforce, recruitment retention, long-term strategy, regular data. That affects every country and every area of work that nurses are in. So in all of those areas, we are involved at an, an international level. And it takes lobbying, constant lobbying, because every time you go out the door of, no matter whether it's the director general or whoever, somebody else is coming in behind with another issue, equally as important to them as ours is, but you have to keep it. And as I said to my colleagues down there, it's talk called passion, patience, and what was the other one? Persistence, thank you. So it's really important. And some of those um, committees are very intimidating. If I think it's intimidating to be up here, it's much more intimidating to be at those tables. And I was at one, um, it was the WHO um, Commission on NCDs. And I was one among 40 or 50 other people, none of whom were nurses, none of whom cared about nursing. And it is very difficult to get your voice across that we are so important in the health service. So you have to line yourself up with people that will support you and people that you will convince. And you do that at lunchtime, at coffee time, at different times. So, the state of the world's nursing, pretty poor. 2020, WHO gave us, an, from 191 countries, said that we were 6 million short. Then we went on with another group, ICN, went on to look at this report, Aging Well, with those people up there. And what do we discover? But that the aging workforce, which is mainly in Europe and North America, looks like we could be 4 million short in the less than 10 years. So add that to the 6 and you have 10 million. The thing about the retirement age is very difficult because if you look at retirement, some countries have retirement at 65, some countries have it earlier or later, but that's not the real retirement age. The retirement age is whatever time you get out at, which may be when you have 40 years service, maybe it's less, maybe you won't be 60, maybe you'll be 58, maybe you'll be... so you cannot go on the retirement age of the country because you have to put into the equation that some people might be getting out as soon as they have enough money to retire. The latest research, which we did during um, COVID, and that was picking up a lot of um, information that we picked up, was what would you say is crude information, but it was up to the minute information. It was information we were getting from countries, our own NNAs throughout the world. And what was coming across loud and clear was the fact that a lot of nurses were burnt out, they were stressed, there were there were mental health issues, they had long-term COVID, and they were getting out earlier. And we saw that even in America, that nurses started to become travel nurses, which we in other countries call agency nurses. And they started moving from hospital to hospital and getting more money and reducing their hours. That doesn't help anyone. So, we did some aging policies, and I'll show you those later because I think that's important. You can't have people at 60 or 65 doing the same things as they did when they were 30. Not possible, not physically or mentally possible. So, how do we train, retain our older workforce? You don't have to worry about all of this because this is all an ICN website. And in case you don't remember, just go to the website and go to Aging Well and you will find it there. 
was a judge that told me that they might fall asleep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have ways of making them wake up, don't worry. Oh, I'm sorry for all of you out there. Um, I know it's very different to what it was in 2020 and 21 when I was looking at a black screen. So it's nice to look at an audience now. And I know that some of you are looking at a screen. So this is important because for all of you that are making any decisions about workforce, and even if you're not making decisions, you can influence decisions. Like those four people that quizzed me up and down earlier on, it'll be up to you to influence decisions, right? Yeah. So, if you're looking at an older workforce, remember, you have to look at different types of work. You have to look and see if they can do, you know, supervisory work, mentoring, prospector, whatever you like. And they may look, but they may be too embarrassed to go to their accountant and see if, you know, or if they work shorter hours, could they get enough pension to go and, and work three days or work couple of hours or work whatever but you know somebody has to talk to them okay but here is Canada and I think that is very important anywhere you have 19% over 60 down to 5% in Newfoundland 6% and here 12% in Ontario so you can see in the next couple of years, quite a lot of people will be retiring from this country. What's going to happen then? What's happening in every country in the world? They're going out to recruit to other countries. Immoral, not right. People can travel. I have no difficulty. Irish people traveled all over the world. But aggressive recruitment isn't right. So. These are some things that we had during, um, that we picked up during COVID-19. And I don't want you to get too concentrated on it all, but there are two areas that are still coming to the fore. One is violence. And violence is still being talked about today, very much today. And very recently, um, Mike Ryan from WHO gave um, a lecture to some um, graduates in the university in, at home in Ireland. And he said that in all his life, going through Iraq, Iran, and being in conflict zones and everywhere else, he had never experienced the violence that he had during COVID-19. And as far as he was concerned, he was in a protected environment. But what he said was, I feel sorry for the people that are on the front line because that is unacceptable and it is not safe. So that's what I'm worried about, all of those people out there. And it's up to us and to all of you to protect our people in the front line. Mental health, we've heard a lot about that. And mental health definitely is a major issue, as well as long-term COVID, as well as occupational. When we went out to do a lot of this research, what we found was that a lot of the countries were not recognizing COVID, long-term COVID as an occupational disease. Because what they were trying to say was, no, maybe you didn't get it in a hospital. Maybe you got it at home. So it's now it's not an occupational disease. No, we won't pay you for you know, long-term COVID. Not right. You put them into this position. You didn't give them protective clothing. You are wrong. How am I doing for time? Is that all? <laughs> OK, the effects of COVID. So the estimate, according to the WHO, is that anywhere between 80 and 180 thousand healthcare workers died during COVID. We know that's an underestimate because countries did not pick up. There was no standardized information. ICN lobbied extremely hard 
for countries to pick up information on the deaths and the infection rate among healthcare workers. Constantly, constantly. And it had the effect on WHO going out and trying to get it, but countries refused to do it. But this is where we're at, and that was a year ago. Those 180,000 should never have died. Never have died. They did not go to treat patients with a deadly disease with no equipment. People aren't even sent to war without the proper equipment. This, this second one is interesting, not just because 10% of workers have COVID, but the fact that hospital acquired COVID ranged from 12% to 44%. Why do you think that is? Should I ask my students again? Really? Yeah. Well, possibly because you know, there's not enough resources. So if you haven't enough people to go from country to country, to, from patient to patient, then what do you expect? Are they going to be washing their hands? Are they going to be changing their gowns? Are they going to have enough time? And this is all the other things they can get. But what I'm more concerned about is the cost of COVID. 16 trillion is what the estimate is right now. 16 trillion. If they put a couple of million into having strong healthcare systems, that could have saved lives and saved economies. But because they wanted to save economies, they were willing to borrow to their ears. 16 trillion. Never forget that when you're looking for money. Okay, this is basically about healthcare workers and patient safety. It makes perfect sense. If you keep your healthcare workers safe, if you keep them happy, if you treat them well, give them a good salary, your patients are going to be safe. They're going to have good quality of care. No doubt about that. That has been seen by Linda Aiken, by anybody that has done research, that there'll, there'll be less deaths, less infections, less... I don't have to tell you that. You've read it millions of times, but it's time to use it. It's time to speak up. It's not just up to me. It's up to you to know the facts. It's up to you to know what you're talking about. Oh, this is about women. This is a quality game. We represent 70% of the healthcare workforce. No disrespect to all you guys down there, but we represent 70% of the workforce. 90% of the workforce in nursing are women. But a quarter of the leadership positions, and even less in nursing. We should be in there making decisions. It's no wonder they're wrong. <laughs> now, I just want to watch the comment over there, because I think it's a good one. Um, Tedros said that we're the linchpin of healthcare, playing a crucial role, never mind that. Any society with too few health workers is operating with one hand tied behind its back. It's very true. Can't operate with too few health workers. These are all the things from the strategic direction. You may know them, you may not know them. Invest in nursing education, jobs, leadership, service delivery, safety of nurses, and the well-being of nurses. Yeah. That makes for safe patients. And you know, the funny thing about all of this is all governments were involved in COVID. All government. They were involved in making sure that they saved lives and saved economies. Why? Because they needed healthy workers to work. So for me, healthcare should be part of all government. 
because unless you have healthy workers, you don't have a healthy economy. It's as simple as that. Oh. Okay, I'll go quickly, sorry. <laughs> I'll only go on this left one. The economic benefits invested in healthcare are 10 times greater than the costs. So why wouldn't you invest in healthcare? If investing it makes sense, that if you invest one dollar, you get 10 back in health of people and their working ability. But why? Why don't we invest? Anybody? How about my nice students down there? They're getting really worried about me now. <laughs> Mainly it's because when governments or politicians invest, they expect a quick return. There is no quick return in health. It's a long time. So they'll be out of a job because they haven't got the votes. That's why. This here, uh, just very quickly, if you're in a low-income country, that's what you need for basic life support. If you're in a high-income country, this is what you need. Now, what I will say is that did the high-income countries do better in COVID-19 than the low-income countries? Absolutely shamefully not. And yet, we're spending a lot of money. This is where I think we fall down. Women aren't paid. They're not paid for caring. They're not paid for caring for children, for older people. It's not looked as a real job. It's not looked as something you should put money in. So we're saving governments loads of money. If you look over that side, you can see that we save three trillion. That's an underestimate, way, way underestimate. But still, we're saving money. It also is what makes it difficult for nurses to get money because it's seen as a caring role and caring doesn't get money and caring has always been there and why would you need money to care for children or older people or why would you need a lot? It's part of caring. And they're always, nurses will always look and go out to the poorest in society. So effectively, we're always subsidizing the health systems. And this is one thing that I will just talk to um, Verna, because I know that she was big into public health. And I know that was, and she was right. She was way, way right. If you invest in public health, if you invest in, in primary care, if you invest in early intervention, it, will, it is the way to go. It's the way that nurses were trained and the way that nurses can do huge, make huge inroads, not in the specialist areas, not in the last 10 years where all the money is poured. Look up here, this is um, NCDs. You can, early intervention can do an awful lot in NCDs, and you know that. If you're talking about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, if you're talking about respiratory disease, if you're talking about cancers, screening, early intervention at home, working with families, working about diet and exercise and all of the things that go with it can save a lot of lives and make very productive lives. I'm not going to go through this, you know a lot of this, but we have to be there to reimagine a health service. That the way that we're going is not going to work. We have to do something different. And nurses, and I see them all over the world, they're going out doing telemedicine. I see them going out on horseback. I see them going out making up vans in Latin America. I saw them in South Sudan where they were actually working in hospitals 
for nothing because there was no money in the health service. They know what works. Nurses know the best models of care. So all of you that I'm looking at down there, you have to start imagining a different health service. I think you recognize her. <laughs> so what do we need to do? We need to advocate and lobby. I think I have only one more. Is that OK? Um, what one will I pick? Probably get recognized for unpaid health care work. Because if we don't get recognized for unpaid health care work, I don't think that we can get better salary or conditions. Gender, yes, definitely gender. Visibility, that's where we fall. Visibility for nurses. Do we have visibility? Did we have visibility during COVID? No, we didn't. Where were we on strategic plans? Where were we on the media? We were probably caring for patients. We were probably telling people how to turn the patients in intensive care. We were probably testing. We were probably vaccinating. We were doing everything. But we weren't there at the decision-making table in very few countries throughout the world. And believe you me, we did surveys on it. We weren't there. We have to change that. Otherwise, we'll be at nothing. Um, one thing there I will say, and it's about information from other countries. And that's why it's important sometimes to be in ICN or to be looking at different areas. Because you learn from other countries. I mean, and for just for now, um, three quick examples. Norway have pushed for more, for recruiting more nurses, 10,000 more nurses they've been pushing for. Um, in Ireland, they've got 6.5% um, increase over the next two years with a 1% cost of living. But they have done that through working with all the public sector unions. So all the public sector unions fought for an increase, just uh, they agreed it about a week ago. And you have Switzerland, totally different system altogether, and they went to the public for a referendum. They can go to, the, now you can't do it in any other country except Switzerland. They have a unique, unique, I will say, um, legislative system. So they went to the public as nurses, and they got the public vote that said, yes, we want um, safe staffing levels. We want better conditions for nurses. It'll be up to them now to push governments to do it. But have a look around and have a look at other countries, what other countries are doing. I always believe in one thing. Whatever you think, somebody has thought about it before. So don't go over the same ground. Just look and find it. Advocacy. That's where your three Ps come in. And you will find that in this area here, very good um, framework. Look it up. It's very practical. It's about health service. And there's only one, two things I will say. If you're looking for something, it doesn't matter whether you're in a hospital, whether you're in a university, no matter where you're looking for it. Know what you want. Be very clear about the evidence for what you want. And I mean clear. Don't give them pages and pages. Just be clear. Remember, these are not health people. They're not scientists. They don't want, they have short-term memories, like myself. So they only want a couple of lines. And they, who is your opposition? Oh God, it's so important to know who your opposition is and what they're going to come up against. Who are you trying to influence? Is it a policymaker? And what's in it for them? There's always something in it for them. You have to make sure you know what's in it for them. And even if we go back to the money, you can always say, well, if we put in X number of nurses, we would have saved you in relation to the number of medical errors, which I forgot to show you because that's millions. We would have saved you in relation to the amount of money that you poured into COVID. We would have saved you in the amount of mistakes that are made. Look, you will find that information. I can find it globally. You can find it locally. 
So that's who you're going to plan. Who are your partners going to be? You need some partners. Key messages and all the rest. But the only one thing to remember is when I said patience. Don't get upset that you didn't get to your target. Just have a look and see, well, maybe we'd ha had a little win. Maybe we had a little, you know, more than we thought. So always reflect back on what you have won and keep going. Last one, you'll be glad. Um, this is my favorite. You're never too small to make a difference. That is the title of her book. And if you remember, she was a little girl sitting outside the government with a placard, and then she became the most famous person in the world as regards climate change. Um, and when I was saying that, I was saying it to a friend of mine, and the only thing that kept coming into my head was, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you've never been in bed with a mosquito. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annette. We do have time, a small amount of time, for a couple of questions. If there are questions from people in the room, or Rebecca will help me if there are questions from those who are watching from afar. Any, um, just raise your hand. We have a microphone and we can move around the room if you have a question or a comment. Yeah, sorry. Uh, up. Excellent, Stephen. Thank you uh, for this wonderful lecture. Um, you've mentioned somewhere that nurses are not always great at talking about the lives we save every day or advocating for ourselves. My question is, how can we make nurses great at doing these things? How can we build that capacity you know, to be able to engage to lobby, you know, those kind of things. Because sometimes, I mean, we've all recognized that no one will talk for us. We have to do the talking ourselves. So if you are not lobbying as we should and not talking and engaging the media and being on television shows and talking about COVID and all those other things, which we see other professionals do, what can we do to support nurses to be able to do that? Okay, I have a question for you. <laughs> uh oh. When you go, have you got friends who aren't nurses? Oh, sorry, take that again. Have you friends who are not nurses? Yes, please. And your family are not nurses? Yes, I do. When you go home after a hard day, what do you say to them? Do you say that you've had a terrible day and that you, you know, saved somebody's life or that you, you know, had a very hard incident, somebody hemorrhaged or somebody did something that yes. was difficult? Yes. Do you tell them all that? Yes, I do. That's the way to start. You have to start with your own people. If you don't start talking about what you're doing, and how would people know? Because you ask people, the ordinary society, they have no idea what nurses do. Mm -hmm. So you start at home, and you start with your friends telling them. And then you get yourself on to whatever committee you can get yourself onto, local committee, hospital committee, or even an outside committee. Like it might be sports committee, it might be whatever. Broaden your horizons. It's about, it's not exactly about going to the media and say, I want to talk. It's not. It's getting your message out there to other people who don't know what nurses do. That's where I would start. Mm -hmm. And you move from there. And everybody can do that. But we don't. So we in tend brief, to be that's quiet. More. So in brief, that's small. Absolutely. If, okay. if every one of you started small, can you imagine how many people would know what's happening? Hmm. A lot of nurses out there, 28 million. They could influence a lot. And you could influence politicians when they're coming around to your door. You know, and you're saying, what are you doing for health? What are you doing for nursing? You might get my vote if you do a little bit more. You know, there's yeah. all sorts of ways. Doesn't have to be, you know, straight up to the media. Very good if you get there or if you have a story to tell them. 
but usually they're only interested in a bad story, <laughs> unfortunately. Does that make sense to you? Excellent. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Thanks, You're welcome. Stephen. I think there's a question online, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, this question is from Michael Villeneuve. Oh, and Mike. Yeah, he's watching online. Oh, Mike. And he said, uh, Annette, in all my 44 years in healthcare, I never saw anything as gendered as the treatment of nurses during the pandemic. I know it's very complex, but do you have any observations, advice for allies? Good question, Mike. I could easily turn that back to you. <laughs> um, I think sometimes we are our own worst enemies. I think we don't fight for a place in, when I saw um, a lot of the um, strategic decision-making bodies and a lot of the action bodies, I didn't see even chief nurses um, fighting for their role on those committees. And I didn't see them fighting to be part of the media briefings. Um, so that, I think, is our responsibility. Uh, what else happens? Um, I did see some things that I thought should have been broadened out a little bit more. For example, I saw um, a nurse in England, and she was doing a radio program for um, people who weren't English speaking. They were probably, um, they came from India and different places, and she knew that they didn't understand um, the restrictions and the reasons about COVID. And so she did a broadcast every um, couple of days to inform them in, her own, in their own language. Now that should have been pushed out a little bit more and it should have been broadcast a bit more because there wasn't just, that wasn't just a part of England. It was part probably of every country that had migrants who really didn't understand what was happening and what they were supposed to do. And how could they, you know, because if they weren't hearing it in their own language, it was difficult. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of other things that if I could think of right now, I would tell you. But Mike, if you have any bright ideas, because God knows you have been <laughs> on the Canada scene for quite a long time. So, and sorry that you're gone off it because I haven't heard from you in a while. I've given him your email. Oh, have you? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if you want to uh, answer Mike and see, have you any bright ideas? See if he's is he typing back? Does he type back? I think he's typing. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh, there's a couple more. I think it's Vanessa and then. Thank you, Annette. Thank you so much for the opportunity to see you in person. Thank you. Um, Sometimes I worry that nurses come back with anger. And I think it's an opportunity that we have to be really careful of because it gives policymakers a chance to do something that we're actually not fighting for in the first place. If we're coming back with anger and it's potentially a side of the government that might react to something that we're not looking for. So I think, um, I'm looking at, could you please speak a little bit to the point of nurses being really strategic in terms of when, the, how they can propose solutions as opposed to anger. Um, in some of the optics of our current healthcare environment? I think that's a very good comment, actually. Um, and you do see it. I think that many times nurses go in, and I'm sure other people do too, um, expecting that what they ask for will be given. But it works two ways. So they go in for something, they make a case for it, but there has to be something in it for the person that they're asking. I don't care whether it's the chief executive of the hospital, whether it's the chief executive of the um, university, or wherever it is. There has to be something in it for them. And, and there will be. There will be. But you have to tell them what's in it for them. And I agree with you. 
anger does nothing for anybody. You have to, and it's very good to get, you know, any person that will support you, they are good, and to watch out for the ones that are against you. That's equally as important. But yeah, I absolutely agree, anger does nothing for anyone. I think there was another question. Hi, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. Um, my question is, what advice do you have on how to protect nursing work during like a global nursing shortage in organizations? For example, I work in an organization where I, right now where I'm asked as a nurse educator to develop a plan to have our physicians learn triage um, and to be essentially the triage nurse as part of a contingency plan where we're short triage nurses. Um, and paying them $1,500 to be to, to come in and do nursing work, essentially. Um, so I was just wondering what advice you have in terms of, like I've raised my concerns of how it's important to protect nursing work, such as being the role as a, as a triage nurse. But um, it's, hard, it's also difficult when, you know, your COO and your directors are coming at you telling you that this is what we have to do and this is what we have to do moving forward. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, first of all, let me say that I don't have the answers to everybody. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a genius that I know. Every, if I was, then I think I'd be somewhere else, and I'd probably be earning a hell of a lot of money, but anyway, I don't. Um, but your question is a very good one, and it is a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. I think that the only thing that you can lay out is... Um, what the alternative is to not doing what you propose. And there is always, you know, um, I suppose, negatives to what, what you're saying. And saying that, and, and bringing always patient safety into it. Patient safety is the only thing that you've got to rely on. But know your, um, I suppose, Evidence, and I don't mean that you have to go through a, a lot of um, different things, but I think what we don't do is we don't look to find out costings. I think from what I see, I don't have any difficulty going to the accountant and say, how much do we spend on X, Y, and Z? How much do, have we spent on medical errors? How much have we spent on, you know, um, we'll say, um, legal issues, how much have we spent on, they're not going to give you everything, but you'll find out something you have a right to know and say, well, you know, if you did X, you could say Y. You have to be smart in all of the things. There's always other ways around it. And then if you don't get an answer from the person that you go to, sometimes wise to go somewhere else, up higher. You know, not easy, but sometimes you have to do it. But get yourself, don't get yourself into an area where you're the one that's going to be, um, I suppose, targeted. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It's very important that you get, you get support from other people. And I would say that no matter where you are, um, go as a group if you can. Not always possible because sometimes you're in management position and everything else like that. But sometimes it is, if you even talk to the people that you're responsible for and you tell them why and you ask them, you know, can we have your support to go because this is what we need to do because they're going to blame you anyway if it doesn't work. So you might as well have their goodwill. So that's as much as I can tell you, you know, right now. But don't expect that I have the monopoly of wisdom. In the thing. But it's, it's a, it, it is a good question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, just one final quick question, and then we'll, we'll have to close. Okay, so I'm going to make it quick. Um, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful lecture. Um, it's actually been an eye-opener opener for me, and I'm quite uh, happy to be here. My, mine is about um, uh, trafficking. You know, you spoke about trafficking. And in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an, a huge increase in the migration of nurses across the world, especially from middle, lower and middle-income countries to OECD you know, countries. Um, this raises the issue of unscrupulous recruitment practices by companies to OECD countries. What advice do you have for nursing associations to help them forestall the, I mean, um, 
uh, chances of uh, these companies coming to recruit nurses and then maybe exploiting them in the long run? Yeah, it's there. There are ethical policies, but unfortunately, um, what's been happening recently, like there's ethical policies among governments, there's ethical policies in WHO, there's ethical policies a lot. But what we have heard in recently, or at least I have, is that the ethical policies become kind of non-existent when government to government say we are going to, you know, agree to um, take X amount of nurses, you know, to a country, and the country says, yeah, we agree because we have jobs for them, or we have too many nurses, or that kind of thing. That's difficult. That is, and, and that is happening right now. Um, you cannot stop people moving, and you cannot stop people from looking for a better life for them. But the unfortunate thing is, um, we have to put pressure on own governments to grow their own. And, and we, ha we all have to do that in every country throughout the world. In my own country, in the UK, they have the highest number of um, vacancies than they have ever had. And of course, they are going out to different countries. America's going to be in big trouble very soon too. And I imagine Canada is also in trouble. But, you know, and it's all about, you know, looking after our own. It becomes a real um, nationalistic issue. So, you know, we're so... Uh, bad, and they don't realize that they're looking at countries that have uh, not even a tenth of the number of nurses they have in thing. The only good news, I would say, which has nothing to do with um, trafficking or aggressive recruitment by agencies, is that there is talk about having much more, um, uh, what would you say, control, not control, but um, regulation on recruitment companies, because currently there's very little regulation on recruitment companies, and there has to be regulation on recruitment companies. The other thing that I would say is, and it's not um, positive to nurses or anybody else in health service, but there's something that low-income countries and middle-income countries are doing that high-income countries should learn from. Because in COVID, high-income countries did not do well. Shame, but they did not do well. Low-income countries, very little money, very little resources, did better. So somewhere along the line, we have to be sharing that kind of information for the future. Doesn't quite answer your question, but it might make you feel a little bit better. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. In respect of everybody's time, I think we'll bring the session to a close. And Annette, I'd like to thank you for your thoughts and your stories and your expertise. Thank you all for joining us, either in person or virtually. It's been wonder to get, wonderful to gather and continue to connect with our Bloomberg nursing community. And I invite you all to keep an eye on your emails, follow us on social media, and visit our website to stay up to date on upcoming events and offerings here at the faculty. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Congratulations. Thank you.